from the Fogelman von Platterborn. I want to introduce to you, first of all, uh, Joanna Hartunas, who I just met today, Director of Communications. I think you'll be hearing from her at some point during the day. We've got Josh Fogelman here, Aaron von Platter here. These two guys uh, came through the Baylor practice court program uh, almost a decade ago. It's hard to believe it's been close to that long, but it has been. Uh, Aaron uh, was an insurance adjuster before he came to law school. He was a 99 UT grad and then a 2009, I think, Baylor law grad, correct? 2011. 2011. 2011, okay. Uh, and Josh, you were a 2008. Later grad, that's right. Uh, clerk for the uh, Texas Supreme Court uh, was uh, briefing attorney with uh, I believe it was Justice O'Neill, wasn't it? Correct. And these two are here to talk to you about something that I have a real uh, experience with and heart for, and that is being an advocate for people. There, uh, as you will hear, uh, those of you that have already gone through PC with me have heard me reference this. Those of you that have been coming through PC will hear me reference this in the future. It's simply this, that there is very, a very dedicated effort at what is referenced as tort reform messaging that for various economic and political reasons have uh, sought to inoculate jurors at times days, with the idea or the perception that trial lawyers are bad, that uh, uh, personal injury cases are a grab for money. And when done right, when done well, when done for the right reason, that Seventh Amendment right to jury trial is absolutely vital. In order to protect our democratic system, in order to protect people in the with people, they're here to talk to you about the uh, business uh, development, professional development, practice development of uh, personal injury litigation. And with that, I'm going to turn it to you guys. Join me in welcoming you. Thank you, Professor Rand. Thank you all very much for attending. We're really happy to be here uh, talking to you guys. As Professor Wren said, I'm Josh Fogelman. A um, little bit about myself. Um, born and raised in Austin, uh, Texas. Went to the University of Texas for undergrad where I got a degree in human relations, which basically meant that I wasn't smart enough to get a degree in natural sciences like I had initially intended to. Um, in college, I started working, actually when I was 18, I started working for a young litigator named Jason Nassour, who was, is also a Baylor Law alum, uh, who was fairly fresh out of law school. Took a liking to him, he kind of took me under his wing, worked for him uh, all, through, uh, all through college, uh, and actually uh, developed a really good relationship with him. Watched him develop his practice and watched his practice expand, he started his own practice worked with him through law school. He actually uh, really encouraged me to come to Baylor Law School for the litigation program. So I did that, I uh, graduated from Baylor Law in 2008, as Professor Wren said, and went to, work for the, went to work for the state for a year, did the clerkship with uh, Justice O'Neill, and then actually went back to work with Jason Nassour uh, after, after I finished that year with the state where I learned, uh, learned a little bit about general uh, civil litigation. So, yeah. May I? You may. <clears throat> Thanks for having lunch with us, guys. My name is Aaron Von Flater, and, and uh, to pick up on where that story left off, I had graduated uh, Baylor Law in 2011, went to work for uh, a guy who was an incredible litigator on the defense side. So he was working, doing State Farm insurance defense cases, and he happened to be friends with Jason Asour, so long story short, we ended up co officing as a group. And uh, he happened to die, and so when he died, I was absorbed into, into Jason Asour's firm with Josh, we're working on a really large case together. Uh, and we bonded over that case because we were the associates doing all the hard work and uh, stressing out and worrying every night about it. And uh, we found that we had a good chemistry, 
and eventually decided to split off on our own. We started our personal injury law firm in 2014 and have grown uh, pretty quickly since then. And so that's uh, kind of a platform. As for me personally, I didn't uh, grow up in Austin. I grew up all over the place. I was the son of an oil field worker. Uh, my mom was a school teacher. And so I came from kind of a different perspective to law school. I had already worked for insurance companies for eight years. And uh, I think that gave me a unique perspective that uh, you'll find out more. I think it helped us form a good partnership together. So, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, Aaron, Aaron and I uh, have decided that we wanted to pursue a start, start a personal injury law firm and uh, really get out there and develop our own business, e business ethos where he and I have the opportunity to develop what the face of the firm looked like, what the ethics of the firm looked like, uh, customer service of the firm looked like, and have been able to really begin to put that in place and help to, to begin to realize our vision of running our own practice, which is something that we understand some of y'all might be interested in doing someday as well. So. so one of the things that we want to talk about here is obviously the elephant in the room is personal injury lawyers, ambulance chasers. Why, why do personal injury lawyers have a bad reputation? Okay, so uh, Professor Wren did a great job of kind of priming you for this. Um, you, have it, how many of y'all know who Carl Rove is? Does everybody know? Really famous about 10 years ago, then he retired, and I don't know if he's still on, on the radar or not, but he's kind of a, a diabolical political genius architect of uh, the George Bush administration in the White House and also the gubernatorial campaign here locally. Um, one of the things he did in the 80s uh, was to pick up on tort reform, and it was just at that time it was a popular idea, but he, he made a connection that was really important. And he realized that if you looked at the list of all the top donors to the Democratic Party, they were all trial lawyers. And he was able to push this idea in the public's mind of a conspiracy, which is we had a, at that time a Texas Supreme Court that was full of Democrats, and they were writing opinions that I think they even admit were pretty blatantly favorable to the plaintiffs. 60 Minutes had come up with a, an expose to show the Texas judges and the Texas trial lawyers were a little too close and too cozy. And he took this idea and basically turned it into this incredible weapon, which was if you're a candidate on the Democratic side, you need the money from the trial lawyers, but if you take it, they can point at you and say you're corrupt. And, and he basically cut the money supply off uh, to the Democratic Party as well as um, was, was able to just get people to rally behind tort reform. So instead of it just being one part of a platform, it became this juggernaut for the Republican Party and, and they ended up, not to, I'm not casting aspersions on any party here, I'm just saying that was how it, it, it organically developed. And uh, coming into the 1994 gubernatorial campaign with, with George Bush, uh, something else happened. I guess I'll yeah, who, who here has seen the HBO documentary Hot Coffee? Right, so in 1994, uh, an elderly woman, Stella Lee Leibnitz, I believe was her name, uh, spilled some hot coffee on her lap, McDonald's hot coffee. She filed a lawsuit against McDonald's alleging a product liability action, stating that the, that the coffee that McDonald's was serving was inherently too hot and therefore a dangerous product. Uh, she had actually intended or attempted to settle the case with McDonald's for the amount of her medical bills McDonald's was having none of it, and took the, so uh, their attorney took the case to trial where they secured a pretty significant compensatory damages judgment, I think about $160,000, and a seven-figure punitive damages verdict against McDonald's, which when stacked on top of what was going on in the public forum about tort reform and jackpot justice really was kind of a tipping point in the public perception about greedy personal injury lawyers, frivolous lawsuits, um, people becoming millionaires overnight uh, based on their personal injury claims, the manufacturing of, of injury claims in order to get rich, and it really, uh, really kind of pitted common sense against this sort of public notion of abusing the litigation system in order to gain financial advantage. So that's, that's sort of uh, sort of in, has developed over time into the development of terms like ambulance chasing and, and really tarnished 
in the public perception, the reputation of people who are personal injury lawyers and advocates for people who do get injured. So, um, yeah, basically, um, we kind of want to talk to you guys now with that, uh, that as, a, as a basis and understanding of, of what it is that we're all up against when we're trying to make a decision about whether this is a type of law that we might want to practice. We want to help you guys know more about what the actual practice of personal injury law looks like so that it might be something you can consider uh, uh, getting engaged in yourselves. So, some things that you guys might not know about personal injury law other than what you've heard, uh, heard in, in the news media. Um, first and foremost, personal injury law is very complicated and the stakes are very high. Um, I, I want you to put yourself, has anybody here ever been involved in a really bad car wreck or been in, involved in an in a injury incident that was real disruptive of their lives? You have, okay, so for, you, you'll relate to this then. When someone gets injured unexpectedly, it is extraordinarily disruptive, it's unexpected, of course, and it throws their world into a curve. And immediately, from day one, this person who has just had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time begins being inundated with decisions that they have to make, and they're decisions that will ultimately impact their ability to handle the situation in a positive way down the road. Uh, things like phone calls from insurance companies, people telling them what they should or shouldn't do, decisions about how to pay for their medical care, decisions about if it's a car wreck, how to handle their property damage. And uh, it, it's, it's a really, really bad situation for a person to start with. And there are a lot of decisions that have to be made very early on in the process in order to help put your client, put the client in a, in a position where they're not being taken advantage of by the numerous people, medical providers, hospitals, insurance companies that have their fingers in the pie. So, so developing a personal injury case starts at, immediately at the beginning and it is very complicated and involves uh, handling a variety of different interests that, that become involved in the case. Yep, so uh, one of the things that I like to say is that we don't, and I tell clients this, we don't make our money and we don't make your money as a client by beating our chest, threatening adjusters, all the stuff you see on the, the TV ads for, for you know, plaintiff's personal injury lawyers. The way we handle our business is we create a strategy and we check off checklist items and every case is kind of like a snowflake. You know, you're going to have a, a different questions about, you know, where should someone get medical treatment? How are we going to document this? How are we going to put together compelling and undeniable evidence of both the negligence and the injury? Um, how are we going to finance that medical treatment? Should we use the, the, the client's health insurance? Should we use their PIP insurance? Do they have workers' comp insurance that might overlap with the at-fault party's uh, uh, carrier? So. As we go through, we've got to figure out, you know, what experts to employ, who are the witnesses, who lives with this person that can testify to what they're going through, who at work can testify to how their job has suffered, what doctor is going to come in and say, this is going to happen forever, this is permanent, and this is what this means for the future. Um, those things have to be decided on an ongoing basis, but a strategy has to be there early, and the client has to buy in. Um, and it takes, so that's just, you know, a primer on some of the strategy. Yeah, it, it really becomes one of the beautiful things about personal injury law is it becomes a partnership between the client and the lawyer. It's not the lawyer just going out there and, and writing a contract or, or filing a bunch of motions. It is very hands-on, weekly discussions with the client, making sure that they are being properly and adequately maneuvered through the medical treatment phase and so forth and so on so that they are making good decisions that actually help you then become an advocate for them when the time is right. And, and you have to understand here that, that at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is protect the client's Seventh Amendment right. From day one, the vast majority of personal injury cases in practice that any of you guys will, will ever, ever encounter is going to be trying to, trying to recover money from an insurance company. That's the vast majority of what we're doing. And insurance companies are for-profit companies. From day one, 
their goal is to pay your client as little money as they possibly can in order to get your client to sign on the dotted line and go away, period. That's, that's the truth, okay? So as personal injury lawyers, our job is to help our clients exercise their right to trial by jury if necessary, which is really one of the most incredible checks that we have on the, against the power of big businesses. We get the, we get the opportunity to go and talk to, talk to our peers and fight the insurance companies and let, let a jury of our peers make a decision to help us understand how much a person should be compensated for the losses that they have sustained as a result of somebody's negligent conduct. So protection of the Seventh Amendment right is really at the heart of, of what being a personal injury lawyer is. So we're gonna try and kind of outline what, what we have determined to be the basic, uh, if we were to break down what a typical personal injury case looks like, what the five main steps of a personal injury case are. And step one, which can be very difficult sometimes, is listening. We get calls from people who are in distress. They've never been involved in a situation like this. They're getting bullied around by insurance companies that they don't trust, that are telling them what to do. They are unable to go to work. They're unable, how are they gonna take care of their kids? People that are in distress, people like, people like, people like y'all, people like us, it, it can happen to anybody. And what we have to do is sit down and listen to their needs. What is it that you're going through? What is your financial situation like? What's your work situation like? What are your various insurance situations like? Gathering information, gathering data from each particular person in a unique circumstance so that we can begin to put the pieces together and go down that very complicated decision tree and try to develop an understanding about what we're going to do for them. So the, the next piece of this is education of the client. And uh, one thing that we try to get clients to understand is that a personal injury case is nothing like any other transaction on earth. Um, if you are, uh, if, if you have the worst realtor in the state of Texas, your house is probably still gonna sell for about what it's worth, right? Whereas a personal injury case can have a wide variance in outcomes whether handled by a lawyer or not, they just do. Um, there was a case that Josh tried just a few months ago, uh, the final, last, best, and final offer from the insurance company prior to trial, and I'd like to think that most of our cases are a lot better than this, but was like ten or $12,000. Um, the jury awarded 100 and it was 120 something or something yeah. in that range. So it just goes to show you a factor of 10. Reasonable people disagreeing about the exact same thing. They just saw it differently and it requires advocacy. And, there's, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have to start with that with the client so they understand that, that, that they need to be a partner with us on this. So we educate them about all the different decisions that we're about to have to make and why it matters. Because if they don't buy in, the case will never go anywhere. You know, they've got to be dil a diligent partner with you. Uh, the next part is navigate. Uh, navigating has to do with understanding the uh, you know, once you've got that game plan in the beginning, you know, where are they going to get their medical treatment? What insurance are they going to use? And, and, you know, what witnesses are we going to find? Where's the evidence? Who are we deposing? Once you've got all that, you have to constantly be watching the decision tree as it unfolds, you know, as it branches. Because the personal injury case is rare in the, in the legal world in that all your evidence is coming to you in real time. You know, this isn't a partnership dispute where one partner stole all the other partner's money, not that I did that, and, and then everyone's gotta figure out what the evidence is later. This is unfolding, and the client's calling you in the middle of the night saying, I just got this collections notice. This guy says I need surgery, but I don't have enough for my copay. Should I get the surgery? I don't know if there's enough insurance limits to cover all this. And of course, um, that just requires a steady hand the whole time. It requires a pretty good depth of knowledge uh, my insurance adjuster background obviously helped me, but everyone in this business relies on other lawyers. You know, we're just constantly learning this business as we go and pulling each other. Um, so navigation is, is uh, just an ongoing task. And then, Joanna, if we can get four and five up there, because these, two, these last two sometimes bleed in together. 
Um, <coughs> typically in the life of a personal injury case, once you have once you've done what what Aaron's talked about and led the client through through the um, uh, through the maze of decision making, and we finally get the client to the point where we've been able to identify the long term consequences of their injury, we've been able to calculate all their medical bills, the lost earning calculations, we've got our experts lined up, our expert reports lined up, all these things that you have to do to properly work up the case. At some point, you start talking turkey, trying to get some money in the door. Not just for yourselves, of course, but for the client. Clients put themselves out there. They're out of money. We're trying to get the case done. Sometimes we're able to get that. We're able to get the case done without filing a lawsuit. It's becoming less and less common uh, for reasons that we'll kind of talk about later in this presentation. But sometimes we're able to get that case done uh, just just through a, a demand letter, getting it negotiated and settled. Uh, but oftentimes. We find ourselves in litigation. We probably litigate 80, 80 to 85 percent of our cases would be my rough guesstimate. And so advocacy is really step five. Um, negotiation and advocacy, and those two things come hand in hand. And that means uh, filing a lawsuit, potentially taking the case to trial. Um, in, in the life cycle of a personal injury case, typically, whether you're in, uh, once you're in litigation, Frequently, the case goes to mediation, an alternate dispute resolution that's usually required by court. And if that's unsuccessful, then we take the case to trial and put it in front of a jury and see what they have to say about it. This, uh, you can tell we're PowerPoint pros. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the good and the bad. Um, and Joanna helped us to put this together, asking us some of these questions beforehand. and. Uh, this one was uh, interesting. So our most disheartening experience uh, for me on a consistent basis, it's, it's uh, basically drunk drivers driving around with either no insurance or minimum insurance, harming families and not being able to fix all that. You know, it's very frustrating. Um, I think uh, any case with, with children involved is tough, uh, but any, when you have a sort of unremorseful, repetitive, drunken or high driver, uh, that's particularly disheartening for me anyway. Yeah, and, and really one of the things that you, one of the things, to, to piggyback on what Aaron says, one of the things that you have to get used to and learn to deal with as a personal injury lawyer is the fact that oftentimes what we're able to do for our client is just limited by the fact that there's not enough money available to, to do what you want to do for your client. People getting hit by uninsured drivers, people getting hit by drivers that don't have enough insurance, and really a, an unbelievable lack of education in the public about how to insure themselves properly to put themselves in a good position in the event that they do get harmed by someone who doesn't have sufficient insurance to pay for the damage that they've done. So those are definitely disheartening things. For me, uh, something that, that is, is difficult for me to cope with in, in the practice on a day-to-day -day basis is the fact that we've got a Texas Supreme Court who's doing everything in their power to strip individuals of their rights. Um, a, a great example of this would be a, a case that came out in the late 2000s called Brainerd versus Trinity Universal, which basically uh, destroyed what the legislature had put forth as bad faith insurance litigation. Imagine, imagine you're, you're a person who has purchased half a million dollars worth of insurance in order to protect yourself from being harmed by somebody else, and that happens and you get hurt by an underinsured person. The law used to be that uh, if your own insurance company refused to negotiate and treat you in good faith, they had a fiduciary relationship to you. And if they fail to exercise that fiduciary relationship, you could, get, you could penalize them. You could sue them and you could penalize them. And it was a great check to keep them honest. Texas Supreme Court, along with them, many, many, many other rights, uh, stripped that away and basically put the individual in a really bad position um, against larger corporate interests. And it's really devastating to watch. Uh, so that, that, for me, is probably the most disheartening thing that we have to deal with as, as personal injury lawyers. So the most uh, rewarding experience for me is very easy. It's these cases that we sometimes get where 
the client's already telling us, I've checked with other lawyers, I don't seem to have a case. If you turn me down, I'm just done. I'm not even gonna ask anymore. And uh, we had that experience um, on a case where uh, a woman had died. And it was uh, a really sad case where there was three kids, um, ages three, eight, and 11. And the father, um, I can't say too much about this, but I will just say that he's totally out of the picture now. So he, essentially these three kids have been let down by virtually everyone who's ever touched their lives. And the case was brought to us, the grandma uh, was part of it. And you know, we, we weren't sure if we should take it. We were wondering if we were gonna commit malpractice. You know, we had to learn a bunch of stuff. It was an area of the law that we weren't normally practicing in, but, but we believed in the case. and. We stuck with it and we uncovered evidence in the investigation that was really damning. And we took it to mediation and ended up getting enough money to put all three of those kids through college. And that is an unbelievable feeling if it ever happens to you. I hope it does. I hope it's an actual trial victory, but you know, as opposed to mediation. But it was, uh, it's really thrilling. And that happens several times a year for us. It's, it's really golden, so. Yeah, and, and similarly, you know, one of the u very unique things that I kind of addressed earlier about personal in injury law is you never know who your client's going to be. It can be anybody. It can be anybody. All walks of life. Anybody, okay? It, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's the parameter for being a personal injury client, okay? And, and so in that vein, when you're working with the clients, it's, it's not that they've done something wrong. It's that they're coming to you pleading for help, asking you to help navigate them through the system. And when you're successful in doing so, it's very rewarding. I was at a, I was at a wedding uh, in November and was approached by a woman that had been a client of mine when I was pretty early on uh, as a personal injury lawyer that had been hit by a drunk driver while she was on a motor scooter and severed her liver and was hurt pretty badly. And she came up to me, and I had no idea that this had happened. She came up to me and was like, you don't even know, you changed my life. Um, with what you did for me, I was able to put myself through nursing school, and now I'm an ICU nurse because of you. And those are the types of stories that I think are unique to this, prof to this particular area of law and unique to this profession. And I'm telling you guys, there's nothing more rewarding than that actually fundamentally taking a negative situation in someone's life and transforming it into something positive. That's the power that we have and it, it's, it's, it's truly incredible. So, okay. <clears throat> on, to, uh, on to more serious things, I guess. Uh, starting a business in personal injury law. Um, so, so, obviously, the starting of a business in any any way shape or form unless you've just got a ton of money underneath you uh, is scary because you're going from a situation where you're you're gonna be you're receiving a, a consistent paycheck and you're able to budget and you know what's gonna happen and then you're putting yourself in a situation where you're basically betting on you and and so some of the major initial initial fears are how am I gonna pay my bills how am I going to pay for this? And I think that in the personal inju in injury business in particular, that's true because unlike most other areas of law where you kind of get paid up front in a retainer or you get paid per hour or you get paid per project, you really never know when your next dollar is going to come in the door. So, uh, so, so you, trying, trying to take some time before you go out there and, and launch a personal injury business, you really have to take the time to develop a network and, and figure out where is that business going to come from and try to develop an understanding about what's the life cycle of a personal injury case. So, uh, so, so for me, when, when, I, when, we, when Aaron and I decided to take the, to take the plunge, I was fortunate enough to have been in a position where I had worked personal injury cases for about five years. I, I had an idea, an understanding of what the life cycle of a case was like and what the cash flow was like in, in the personal injury business. But those are definitely things uh, to keep in mind if it's, a, if it's an area of law that you're interested in practicing. So when we first uh, set up the law firm, the 
first thing we discovered is that law school doesn't teach you anything about business. Some of you probably come from a business background and you, you already know a lot of this stuff, but for us it was an unbelievable mountain of, of things to overcome. I mean, just kind of where are we gonna have our office? Who, who's gonna buy desks? What computers should we have? Do we need a website, bank account, maybe a line of credit to fund all these cases because they're expensive, you know, to order medical records and all that stuff. Um, bookkeeping, accounting, you know, figuring out how to register with the state. And what we discovered happily was that law school, even though it doesn't have anything to do with business, it's really good at teaching you to take a problem and break it into its tiny component parts. And so we broke it up, we checklisted, sub-checklists, and we literally just went through a Google Doc that we were sharing and kind of like marking off. And we'd start, every time we thought of something like, oh my God, we need a logo, you know, we would make a new chapter called Logo and then somebody would start typing in <coughs> ideas for companies that, that, that could do that for us. And, you know, just if you can figure out how to do a lawsuit, you can definitely figure out how to open and run a business because in a lawsuit, there's always someone on the other side of the table, you know, uh, objecting every time you try to do something. The business, no one's in your way. You just need to do the work. So um, anyway, that was our experience in the logistics. <coughs> Sure. So, so kind of the the next are uh, the next thing we want to talk about are things that we did right when we were starting the business, or, or things in the past maybe we would have changed and done a little bit better. Um, when Aaron and I took the plunge and decided to leave, um, the probably the best thing that we that we did was have confidence in ourselves. We bet on ourselves. We took a position that if we're going to do this and we're going to take the risks, then we're going to be prepared to sink with the ship if the ship goes down, period. No questions about it. And, and when you have that mentality and you're in a sink or swim mentality, you find the best of yourself. You find what you're able to do. Uh, when you're relying on yourself to put food on the table and you're not getting that paycheck, you're going to get out there and you're going to shake some trees. And, and that's we had what you, kids, by the way, at the time, so, you know. And, and we had support, very supportive wives, we should say. Uh, but, uh, but, but having confidence in ourselves, that's something that Aaron and I never really lacked. We, we, uh, we made the decision, we knew what we wanted to do, and something that Aaron and I also, I, I would say that I think he and I did really well, uh, that, that is something to think about when you're considering doing it, is, is having a vision. What is your firm gonna look like? What is it about you and your firm that makes you better than, the, than your competition? What is it that's gonna make people that you have developed relationships with wanna send business to you, wanna trust you with their clients? And having a vision about how you're gonna treat your clients, what your firm ethos is gonna be like, um, th those are, some, those are some, some things to really strongly consider. Um, what, some, some, of the, some of the big issues that we encountered really early on, though, is we underestimated the amount of support. But what happens when you start your own business is this, okay? You are so scared that you're going to fail that you take on any and every case that walks in your door. Even when you're sitting there looking at it, knowing that it's a terrible case. You take it because it's a potential dollar sign. And, and when you put yourself in that position, when you start getting good cases in the door, all of a sudden you find that you've overcommitted. And you've overcommitted on bad cases. And then you find yourself starting to work on those bad cases to the detriment of your good cases, and you bottleneck. And when you bottleneck, you don't get cash in the door. And when you don't get cash in the door, you can't keep your lights on. So having a realistic idea of the amount of support that you're gonna need moving forward to handle the business is, is something to, to put a lot of thought and consideration into and to budget for. Having support staff worth their weight in gold for sure. And, and being critical about the cases that you take on. Don't just take anything because you're scared you're not gonna make a dollar because you don't make money on those cases anyway. So yeah, find, find, uh, find the things that for you matter most in case selection underwriting is key to this business. Um, I mean, you see on TV that it looks like people will take anything and, and people call you with anything. They're like, I, I just want to sue my dog. I don't know what happened to live here. You know, you, you got to have a good, quick criteria. You know, for us, it's, we really like the client. 
You know, if, if we really like the client, these are credible people that I would have a beer with or, or you know, that I would let my kids be around or something, then I'm going to try to make that case work. And of course, along with that, and if it's a car crash case or something, they need to have been actually hit hard. I mean, you know, that's obviously a credibility gap that we have as people are showing up in trial with, with almost no damage and they, they want to collect millions of dollars. We're, we're trying to fight that. You know, that's the actual challenge and the fun part of being on this side is that we have the moral high ground when we have the right cases, and we don't want to lose that. So um, case selection is really critical. I'm going to go off. And, and, uh, and also learning to manage client expectations <coughs> in tandem with that. If you're going to have a case that comes in and it's got obvious difficulties, don't oversell what you're going to be able to do for your client just to get them to sign that paperwork. It will end in a disaster. I mm -hmm. promise it will end in a disaster. Yep. So maintaining expectations is really critically important, and learning how to do that is a skill. The smartest move uh, was for us, and it's funny because Josh and I answered these questions separately in different rooms. We answered them the same exact way, and on that particular question, it was finding a partner with a complementary, complementary set of skills, someone that's totally different than you, but that you can get along with and work with and who shares the level of intensity that you bring to problems. You know, if you're fired up and they're fired up, it doesn't really matter if they do things a little bit differently than you do, as long as you're both kind of going in the same direction. Um, and even more fundamental than that is to just have a partner. I think all business needs a need partnership. All, all students, like you have in PC, you know, you should have someone that's pushing you on, motivation, accountability, sanity on those days when things aren't going that great. You know, so partnership in general, I think, was the smartest move, but uh, particularly partner with someone who's totally, like, you're totally different than me. Yeah, for sure. Some good ways. Absolutely Some true. Some bad ways. <laughs> Absolutely true. I mean, pick, picking, a, picking a business partner is the same as picking a spouse. You know, you're going to be spending a significant amount of time with them. A significant, you're going to be spending as much time with them as you spend with your spouse some weeks. And, and, and a sometimes a more stressful environment. So be very careful about that and, and be selective. But I agree with Aaron. Um, having someone there by your side to, to pick up your slack or, or, or keep, you, keep you in check is invaluable. So. Oh, okay. Can I get a bullet point? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to promise Joanna I wouldn't make this like a commencement speech because Y'all actually want to hear that kind of advice from someone who's a little more qualified than me, but I'll tell you um, what I mean by get over a lawyer, being a lawyer is actually um, maybe helpful for your employment search because I can tell you employers are going to pick up on this, all right? Uh, when I say get over be a, being a lawyer, I'm kind of talking about making it about you. Um, if, you uh, if you saw a doctor posting on Facebook, oh my God, I just performed surgery. I totally cut this person open and I went, I got the tumor out and I sewed them back up and they walked out into their own power, y'all. It was crazy. And like, LOL, and people are giving thumbs up to that. Like, that'd look a little weird, right? Lawyers do that all the time. It's like, it's, it's like I've got, I, you wake up and you're the protagonist in your own movie. You know, you're waking up to slay the dragon. And it feels like that every day. And for those of us who do it, who know how hard a deposition is, we know how incredible it is that you just went in there and by yourself took a crazy deposition and handled your business. I mean, it's a great feeling and we all want to high five about it. But from the public's perspective, all those brilliant moves, all that, you know, the, the, the legal work that you're doing, it's minimum competency. You know, they've been watching television their whole lives. They're, every lawyer on TV totally handles their business. And it's, it's just, you know, all the brilliant moves that we think we're making, for them, it falls under the category of not malpractice. You know, it's just not that impressive to them. So how do you get over that? How do you actually make your mark on the public and on your clients and on your prospective clients? The thing that they're going to remember that they'll talk about at cocktail parties is that I had this lawyer, they're amazing. Oh, were they amazing at writing briefs? No, I don't know anything about that. They were amazing because they cared about me. You know, they paid attention. I got their attention and their competency and, and their concern, and they were like family to me, okay? And so if you will adopt that mentality now, um, it, will, it will help you in your employment search. I, I had a call uh, from a guy looking for a job who was touting some of his experiences at a, at a firm in Dallas, 
And in the process of talking about it, um, he, he was dropping these things like, I didn't go to law school to do this. I didn't go to law school to do this. And then he like, had this motion hearing, and, and uh, or it was actually a, a bench trial. And he was talking about texting all his other lawyers that I won. And he's like, it was so hard, but I won, and I got up and I won. And I'm like, dude, we won. It's we won. You know, your client is the protagonist. You're, you're the wizard or the guide or whatever you want to be, but, but it, you know, you're not, in, you're not the, the star of the movie there. And so that is a mentality. If you will be client-centric, mission-driven, instead of egocentric, trying to rack up more prestige for your resume, I promise you you're going to be an unbeatable lawyer. And so um, that's a little bit of commencement need, but I meant it to be a little bit practical. Um, learn to be both aggressive and kind. What I mean by that is um, there is absolutely no reason to sacrifice your effectiveness uh, in order to be kind to opposing counsel or kind to even, even the defendant that you're mad at. Um, you can be kind and courteous. Um, just remember who you're being nice to. Is it nice to make a deal with opposing counsel to push a deadline that actually harms your client's case? Is that nice to your client? You know, I mean, you gotta remember who to be nice to. Be nice to your client first, okay? Think about their lives, what they're going through, what they've been waiting for, the fact that their job's hanging in limbo, and, you know, within reason, try to give all courtesies to opposing counsel, grant every request for extension, et cetera. Um, but just remember who you're being nice to. And then uh, practice active listening, probably the hardest thing for me. And one thing I don't know if Baylor is doing it now, but all law schools uh, for a long time didn't teach much about depositions. I know practice court addresses it, um, but depositions are so incredibly hard. You're, you're asking questions, you have an outline, the witness is throwing you answers that don't make any sense and are way off script and lead to all these other questions. But if you're not listening, you're gonna leave them all on the table and this is your one shot to talk to them. And so um, practice now while you can the skill of act active listening, follow up questions. You can practice that without being a lawyer. It's just an incredibly good skill to have and if you can, if you can master it, it will serve you very well. Some advice from me, whether you want it or not. <coughs> um, I think the first one is is just being open-minded. As y'all as y'all are sitting here right now, you got the world in front of you, and, and I understand because I've sat in this chair. Uh, I, I understand that we're surrounded by uh, by this sort of pressure to get that big, high-paying, bracewell job, what, whatever whatever the big buzz one is now. Be open-minded to that, okay? Be open-minded to other opportunities, all right? You don't know that you want to go and spend 80 hours a week in an office pushing paper, okay? You don't know that that's going to make you happy. You don't know what you want to do. You, you've never had any exposure to the legal world uh, out, outside, of, outside of the university. And, and I, I would just say that being a lawyer is very, very difficult. It's a difficult profession, it's stressful, you take your work home with you, and if you wanna add on top of that the fact that you're expected to work tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of hours a week, that's fine, that's fine, that's for some people, it's great. Uh, but there is an opportunity that y'all have right now to go and experience a variety of different areas of practice and a variety of different types of law firms. Uh, there are lots and lots of solo practitioners, lots and lots of boutique law firms doing all sorts of kind of things. And I think that it's a really good idea not to necessarily focus on what the paycheck is going to be right now, even though, <laughs> trust me, I understand what your tuition is like. And I understand the pressure of having to pay it back, but you're going to have time for that. Take the time now to explore and see what strikes a chord with you because if you're going to make a career out of it, you want to like what you do. So, so be open-minded. Um, two, build a network and seek mentors. Um, that, this, is, this is true no matter what, what your career path is going to be. If you want to go and be an insurance defense litigator or whatever it is you want to do. Um, but, but particularly if you have any inkling uh, of entrepreneurship. If you have any desire or drive right now 
to start your own law firm or partner up with someone, start a law firm, then you need to start thinking right now about how you're going to start getting cases in the door. And, and the time to start building those networks is today, not only with who your peers are, but when you start going out there and, and doing your summer clerkships, your, your peers at your clerkships, your bosses at your clerkships, start thinking about, about how wide that web needs to be so that when you decide to take the plunge, you can call upon people and let them know what you're doing and request support. And I guarantee you, if you do a good enough job of doing that, taking that scary plunge, you're going to have a soft landing if you've done a good job of building a network. People will give you business. They will give you work to do. But you've got to put the work in today to get that done. And seeking mentors as well. Um, you, you're not going to be an expert in any field of law when you walk out, when you walk across that stage with the diploma here. You're going to be better than most other Texas graduates and even graduates in the country, I'll tell you that. But you're not going to be an expert. You're going to have to learn, and there's a learning curve. Finding a good mentor, a good couple of mentors that you respect and admire, that you can learn from, go under their tutelage and learn from them um, when you do decide to go your own way, or even if you don't decide to go your own way, uh, having, having learned watching someone you respect to learn their strengths and their weaknesses will put you in a really good position. And then finally, uh, this kind of ties back into, into my, my first point, but you know, life is about more than practicing law and it's more, it's more than about collecting the biggest paycheck that you possibly can. Big paychecks are great. But they're not that great if you have to spend your entire life earning. So, so you know, some people are, are geared towards that type of a lifestyle, and I mean no disrespect to anybody in that position. I respect and admire people who can go in there and burn, burn, and bu burn both ends of the candle. I respect and admire that. But you need to think critically about what your life mission is going to be. What is it that you want? What's your work-life balance going to be? Because I promise you that if you do some exploring and you put yourself out there, you'll be able to find someone that will support that philosophy and help allow you to have a meaningful and fulfilling career. So I think that's all we have to tell y'all, but I think we might have some time to field questions if anybody has any. market against the bad reputation and build a client base when you're competing against these you know, commercials that I, I feel really probably only help build the bad reputation. So how do you build your client base without coming across as an ambulance chaser? Fantastic question. Um, so and that's something that Aaron and I have spent an amount of time that we can't even begin to articulate working, working on. And, and, and the answer is this. It starts with how you treat your clients, first of all, okay? Our, our business philosophy is we try to be something like the Nordstrom's of the personal injury world. Client is always right, period. If we have to waive a fee because a client's being unreasonable, we'll do it. It doesn't matter. Um, making the client feel as though we truly have their best interest in mind rather than the bottom line and the dollar at the end of the day, that's where it starts. From a public perception standpoint, um, we have tried to focus the way that we put ourselves forth in the public as educators rather than personal injury lawyers. We care very, very deeply about having every person that makes contact with us walk away better off than they were when they called us. We will take the time to educate them, answer all their questions, even if we know that we're about to spend 30 or 45 minutes on a case that we're never going to take. Or two hours. We're, or two hours. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to do it because that's what we tell people we're going to do. So practice what you preach. We're actually uh, interested in trying to build the opposite of the TV personal injury law firm because uh, I think Unfortunately, most people who get seriously injured are in a bit of a dilemma. You know, do I call a sleazy injury lawyer or do I try to deal with the insurance companies alone? And most of them who try to do it alone call us at about the year and a half mark 
and they're freaked out. And there's some things we can't fix at that point, unfortunately. And um, that's a shame. And so it's really a, a disservice to the public that, that there's that hesitation. So by providing a resource, you know, our ads are not on TV. We have a, a spot on NPR. We have content on our website that's written by PhD level university professors who have taken the time to research every single nook and cranny of what a brain injury is and how it works. You know, and so by putting ourselves out as an educational resource to people, we're hoping to maybe provide an alternative narrative, at least in Austin, Texas. I mean, we're in a small area, but that's all we can do. How often do you guys have to field those two hour long talks of <laughs> clients who you just either they overestimate their own recovery or they just might not like have any recovery at all? We're, we're trying to spread the love right now. We have, we have a new hire um, who is joining the rotation of people who get those new client calls. I think um, it, it goes in waves. There are Mondays after a weekend where that's all we do, at least one of us. And uh, you know, obviously that's counterproductive, but um, there are people, and I, I can count them. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of people that call us back. You know, a year later, their cousin was in this horrific accident, you know, somewhere else, and all of a sudden they remembered somebody who took the time, and you know, now they're calling us again. So, especially over the last, I mean, to, over the last year and a half since since we've started getting busier. I, I would say we probably spend each five hours a week on the telephone fielding new client phone calls. 70% of them are cases that we're never gonna take. Maybe more, but it does come, it does come and go in waves. So, but it's good, I mean, you practice, right? I mean, every time someone calls you, you have an opportunity to hear a new set of facts and analyze their situation. You're still working, so it keeps, keeps you sharp. Were we that boring? No other questions. Were we that, were we that thorough? <laughs> All right, well, if I can, um, can I sit down for a second? Sure. So, uh, thanks everybody for being here and um, taking time out of uh, you know, training for your exams and stuff. We are um, launching a, an opportunity to do some thought leadership in the field of personal injury law. Um, and I know that a lot of people in your situation, because uh, yes, I do have a background as a professor. Um, so I know a lot of people in your situation are very um, concerned with developing professional experience, uh, getting some contacts, uh, maybe beyond the Waco scene, maybe uh, in Austin, um, and to get you know some some writing experience, getting your name um, out there, and part of a conversation about personal injury law and, and those sorts of um, issues. So we are uh, challenging you to uh, write a text about a topic that you think is interesting, sort of in an article format, but we're looking at about a thousand words. It can be about anything in, in the broad realm of personal injury law, uh, but something that you think is urgent, something where you want to articulate a point of view or uh, tie some concerns together, talk about development and policy making, you know, something that, that gets you uh, excited to write. And send it to us, and um, with some, some editing and some uh, additional mentorship from the three of us, um, we would love to publish your work as part of this um, educational client advocacy site that we are building. Any questions for me about that? Obviously, I put my, uh, my address on there because um, if you're interested in uh, maybe talking more about that, or you have questions about that in particular, uh, reach out to me. And can you, can you read friends. that, the BDF Consulting? Can uh, you read that? Your eyes are so young. I'm sure you can. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, thanks. All right, guys. Well, if y'all don't have any questions for us, we really do appreciate uh, y'all taking time out of your day, even though maybe it's mandatory. We appreciate y'all taking time out of your day to come and uh, listen to us.